Uh, today I'm going to be talking about using machine learning to improve health for understudied populations. Um, so at a high level, uh, I pursue two paths to using machine learning to try and increase equity and in health. Um, the first is, you know, how can we use sort of machine learning approaches uh, to make decision making fairer? Can we audit, for example, human decision making and find human biases? Um, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Rather, I'm going to be talking about uh, a second path I see to using machine learning to increase equity and in health. Um, and that's that we can use it to sort of shed light on the health of understudied populations. Uh, and, you know, in the past, I've done this in various ways. Um, you know, we, we've studied sort of disparities in COVID, disparities in pain, um, as mentioned. Uh, but this being a workshop on sex and gender, today I wanted to talk about two more recent pieces of work which are particularly relevant to sex and gender. Um, the, the first project I'll be talking about relates to menstrual cycles, uh, and the second relates to underreported medical conditions, uh, particularly intimate partner violence. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Let's talk about the first story. Um, this is joint work uh, with Tim Althoff, Daniel Thomas, Paula Hillard, and Yuri Leskovic, um, and it appears last year in Nature Human Behavior. So as you all know, you know, cycles are really fundamental uh, to human health, right? You have the daily cycle, like you, know, you sleep at night. Uh, you have a weekly cycle, like maybe you go out on, on the weekends or something like this. The seasonal cycle, you know, you get sad in the winter, you exercise in the summer, and then of course the menstrual cycle. And the, and the menstrual cycle is really fundamental to human health. It's implicated in a whole range uh, of health conditions. Um, in spite of this, though, you know, stigma and lack of large-scale data have really hampered study of the menstrual cycle. And there are numerous manifestations of this, you know, data lacking from medical data sets, uh, you know, menstrual cycle ignored by health tracking apps until recently, clinicians not considering menstrual health, the broader culture stigmatizing discussion. And this is, of course, not some abstract ivory tower issue, right? This results in concrete harm to the health of roughly half the global population. Um, Recently, though, you know, people have started tracking their menstrual cycles uh, using menstrual tracking apps, and, and this offers new potential for understanding and destigmatizing this fundamental aspect of human health. Specifically, today I'll be telling you about data from the menstrual tracking app Clue, um, which is used by millions of people across more than 100 countries. And it provides quite a rich picture of these people's lives that allows people to track you know, their mood, whether they're feeling pain, uh, sexual activity, and crucially for our purposes, when the menstrual cycle starts. Uh, so to give you a sense of the sort of data that you can log with this app, and this is all simulated uh, data for privacy reasons, but it, but it gives you a sense of sort of the data that people can log. Um, you know, people can log period bleeding, enabling inference of when the menstrual cycle starts. Uh, they can log continuous features like resting heart rate or weight. Uh, and they can log, you know, categorical features like sexual behavior or, you know, uh, mental state, etc. So it's quite a rich picture of people's lives. Um, and so what we do is we take this rich data set and use it to provide the first decomposition of human mood, behavior, and vital signs into four simultaneous cycles, the daily, weekly, seasonal, and menstrual cycles I was telling you about before. And by so doing, hopefully we improve understanding of this fundamental and understudied aspect of health. Uh, so the data set consists of 3.3 million people who use this app, um, about 241 million observations. So an observation here is a log from one person at one time point, uh, about 100 countries, uh, and we're going to be studying cycles in 15 dimensions of mood, behavior, and vital signs. So a dimension here would be like happy versus sad mood, for example. So how do previous studies tend to look at this? Um, how do previous studies look at, look at cycles? Typically what they do is they take an average across the entire population at a single time point. So here is a study of happiness as inferred from Twitter data. So, you know, take, take the y-axis with perhaps a bit of a uh, grain of salt if you've ever used Twitter. But, um, you know, you can see that there are sort of clear daily and weekly fluctuations in happiness. And the, the way these authors are doing this um, is, you know, the, the value for Wednesday at 3 p.m. is a population across everyone in the data set on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Similarly, longer time period, still Twitter data, similar methodology. And, you know, we, we can do this in our data um, too, right? So here, here what we're plotting is sort of mood as, as logged by the user on the y-axis. Uh, and, and, you know, just taking a population average over time. Uh, and you can see that there are clear, you know, there's, there's clear signal here, right? Like there's a high frequency fluctuation. That's the, the weekly fluctuation. You can see outliers, like that green dot is Christmas. 
Uh, the purple dot turns out to be the day after Trump gets elected in the United States, which, given that this is predominantly a, a population of young women, is sort of w what you what you would expect. Um, but you've probably already seen the issue here with just averaging across the entire population, which is like, look, if you just average across the whole population on, say, January 3rd, uh, you know, everyone's going to be at a different point in their menstrual cycle on January 3rd. And so, you know, the phases are going to be out of sync and this fundamental source of variation is going to just be entirely invisible. Like this methodology inherently cannot detect that. Uh, so that's quite bad. Um, and so how can we do better? Uh, this is a little, little method Z, and I know people are from different backgrounds, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say it anyway, and then I'll present the results, and those should be pretty intuitive even without the math. So uh, basically what we do is we take each observation, so like mood for one person at one time point, and we regress it on variables which capture uh, the four cycles. So we have one variable for hour of day, one for day of week, one for month of year, and one for day of menstrual cycle. Uh, and then the regression coefficients are going to capture the cycles. That's a little abstract. Uh, let's look at what I actually mean by that. Uh, so here what we're doing is we're decomposing happy, sad mood uh, into the four simultaneous cycles. Uh, so what I'm plotting on the y-axis are the actual regression coefficients. And so sort of higher values are happier uh, and uh, lower values are sadder. And, you know, you can see clear patterns um, emerge, right? You know, you can see sort of that dip in happiness prior to period start, late at night, sort of an increase in happiness on the weekends, uh, dip when school starts. Again, you know, sort of a school age population, this all makes sense. Um, but another important feature of this graph is like, you know, the menstrual cycle happiness amplitude is, is comparable in magnitude to all the other cycles. Like this is just as important. In fact, the largest of, of these four cycles. Um, and so, this is a bad thing to render entirely, entirely invisible. Uh, you know, that's just happiness. We look at 14 other dimensions of mood, behavior, and vital signs as well. Um, and the menstrual cycle happiness, uh, the menstrual cycle amplitude is, you know, the largest for 11 of the 15 dimensions we study. So again, you know, a bad thing, a bad thing to totally ignore. Um, we're also able to look, you know, across, across different countries, you know, we have 109 countries in this data set, that means we can show basically that there's sort of directional consistency in how people respond. So people consistently get a bit sadder prior to the start of period. This isn't just, uh, you know, a, a single country phenomenon. This is useful to know because a lot of previous studies of the menstrual cycle have been done on like, you know, 16 liberal arts majors at Vassar or something like this. And so it's not clear how much they generalize to other populations. Uh, and so this, the data set of the this sort of diversity enables you to take a look at that. Uh, just to avoid any misinterpretation of these results, what are these results not saying? They're not saying women are more volatile. Uh, why? And perhaps to this audience, it's not necessarily to explain why, but in, uh, none, nonetheless, I will do so to avoid any misunderstanding. Uh, there are a couple simple, simple reasons for this. Uh, the first is that our analysis makes no comparison across genders or sexes. Uh, in fact, that's not even data we have in our data set, so we couldn't even do that if we wanted to. Um, previous research that does try to make this comparison does not find sex differences in volatility. There's this great paper entitled Female Rats Are Not More Variable by Male Rats, or Than Male Rats by some author who was like clearly annoyed with this trope. Um, and, and, you know, the reason uh, they don't find that, you know, there are a couple of plausible reasons. The first is like there are male hormone cycles too. They're somewhat less focused on in popular culture, but they're also important. Uh, and the other is that, you know, cycles are not the only source of volatility in human mood, behavior, and vital signs. There are other sources of volatility as well. So uh, what are the takeaways? To summarize, you know, stigma and lack of data have really hampered study of the menstrual cycle. But this, you know, sort of invisible cycle is actually a primary contributor to cyclic human variation. And so we need to study and destigmatize it just like we do, you know, the sleep cycle. It should be just as normal uh, to talk about this um, as it is to talk about the sleep cycle. Um, we've written two other papers on this topic, uh, but yeah, I, I won't talk about them. Okay, uh, second story. This is about understanding the health of understudy populations. Uh, this was work led by Divya Shanmagam, who is a PhD student at MIT. Uh, so the goal of this paper is to try to measure the relative prevalence of underreported conditions. What do I actually mean by that? Uh, so relative prevalence is just how much more common is a medical condition in one group versus another group. So here, for example, you know, maybe we're trying to compute the relative prevalence of the medical condition in black versus Asian patients. Uh, if the red you know, figures there indicate the people who actually have the medical condition, uh, we can compute the relative prevalence quite simply just by taking you know, a fraction. So in black patients, you know, it's, it's four out of nine people have it. In Asian patients, it's six out of nine. The relative prevalence would be four over six or you know, two over three, I guess, if you like to simplify your fractions. Um, so it's very, very simple if the medical condition is perfectly observed. 
Um, but it gets much harder if the medical condition is underreported, right? So now imagine that rather than perfectly observing the medical condition, now we only see that these red folks uh, have it, and so the medical condition is underreported. Now, if we try and take a simple ratio of reporting rates, we're going to get the relative prevalence totally wrong. We're going to compute it as 2 over 1, when in fact it's 4 over 6. So when underreporting varies by group, it becomes much harder to assess the relative prevalence. Why do we care about relative prevalence anyway? Uh, because it enables us to target health policy uh, to the people who are most likely to, to benefit from it. And here's sort of a, case, a simple case study. Uh, in the 1990s, there were reports describing how Native Americans were much more likely uh, to have type 2 diabetes, high relative prevalence in this group. In response, uh, Congress established the special uh, diabetes program for Indians, which sort of allocated health resources for this health condition uh, to this group. And, you know, over the next decade or so, there was a corresponding considerable decrease in the incidence of diabetes in this population. So this is sort of a case where understanding the high relative prevalence enabled efficient and equitable targeting of health policy. Why do we care about underreported conditions? Uh, because they are ubiquitous. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the condition which motivates this work is intimate partner violence. Both Divya and I wanted to work on it. We both read this book entitled No Visible Bruises, which I highly recommend. Um, and, and, and is, you know, sort of a thesis of this book is about the fact that intimate partner violence is all too often invisible. Certainly it's very underreported in formal medical records. Uh, but this isn't just true for intimate partner violence, which I'll be calling IPP. Uh, it's true for many other health conditions as well. So that's why we care about underreporting because it's like very, very common. And medicine. Okay, so I'm going to present a statistical method. I'm going to do it with a little math, but I want to just give you the simple intuition for the method prior to give you the math, right? So let's say we want to understand the relative prevalence of IPV uh, in black patients versus white patients. But as mentioned, IPV is underdiagnosed and maybe to a degree which varies across races. So we can't just take the ratio of diagnosis rates. That will give us the wrong answer. Um, what we can do, though, is from the few people who come in who we actually correctly identify with IPV, we can learn which symptoms are suspicious for IPV. So maybe we say like, oh, these people all tend to have a certain set of suspicious injuries. Then if we're willing to assume that those injuries are sort of show the same patterns across races, we're able to back out the relative prevalence from that. Roughly, the race group which has the higher prevalence of these suspicious injuries is also going to have the higher uh, relative prevalence. So that's sort of the, the intuition for the method. Um, more formally, you know, imagine that you have some true label Y, which is whether the patient has truly experienced IPV. This is not observed data. You don't actually know this. Um, uh, your observed data consists of whether the patient has actually been diagnosed with IPV. So that's actually in the formal medical record. Then for each patient, you also have some, you know, observed features about the patient, like their symptoms. Uh, and then you also know the patient's group, like their age or their race or their insurance status and so on. The method uh, we present is called PURPLE. Um, and even if, you know, this part makes less sense, you'll still understand the rest of the presentation. But I'll, I'll explain a little more formally how PURPLE works. Um, basically what we do is we model the probability that a patient is diagnosed with a condition given their group and their symptoms. This is fully observable from the data. We know S, we know X, we know G. Um, and we model this as the product of two terms. Uh, the product they truly have the disease and the product that they're diagnosed given that they have. So we say, you know, the probability you're diagnosed with the disease is how likely are you to have the disease times how likely are you to be diagnosed if you actually have it. Um, we allow the second term, that reporting probability, to vary across groups to allow for underreporting. The first term, the probability that you have the disease, given symptoms, is constant across groups. Now, if you'll stare at this equation, you'll notice that we actually can't estimate either of the two terms in the right-hand side exactly, since we only observe their product. So you could always multiply one by two and divide the other by two. But it turns out that even estimating PY given X up to a constant like this is sufficient to estimate the relative prevalence. So basically the method is we estimate PY given X up to a constant, and then we look at how that thing varies across groups to estimate the relative prevalence. The other thing to point out here is that this only holds under three assumptions. These assumptions are quite widely made, and we think that they're reasonable. Um, I'm not going to go into them now in the interest of time, but happy to, happy to chat more if it's of interest. So after we estimate, you know, PY given equals one given X up to a constant factor, we can then compute the relative prevalence uh, using this expression. And if you look at this expression, you'll see the reason that constant factor doesn't matter. It appears in both the numerator and the denominator, and it cancels out. 
Okay, uh, no more math. Does this actually work? Uh, yes, basically we show that it does yield reasonable performance. We start with synthetic and semi-synthetic data. So data we kind of simulate. The reason we do that is because if we simulate data, we can check that we're actually able to recover the ground truth, which is known. Uh, and then we progress to real data. Um, you know, I, I won't talk in detail about the experiments we do on synthetic and semi-synthetic data, but basically, you know, we, we want the methods to be on that dotted line. Um, and our method, purple, is on the dotted line, whereas most of the baselines are not. Similar results for synthetic data. We try generating data basically three different ways, or sorry, four different ways using four different sets of suspicious symptoms. We try altering various other aspects of the simulations as well. Uh, and our method, purple, is consistently able to recover the relative prevalence more accurately than our other methods. Uh, you might say, oh, you know, your model makes assumptions. What if the model assumptions are wrong? Um, we really do want people to use this method in settings where it's actually applicable. So we provide a number of checks. First, we provide two checks of the model assumptions. You can kind of rule out obvious cases where the modeling assumptions don't apply. We also show that even if one of the model assumptions doesn't apply, you can still lower bound the magnitude of disparities. Basically what that means is, if I tell you that a disease is twice as common in this group, you, it may not be exactly twice as common, but it's at least twice as common. So if you want to target health policy, you can still be confident that that group is disproportionately affected. Um, finally, we apply this method in real data sets um, for which the ground truth is not known. We try to study IPV, um, and, and we do get results which are consistent with, high, with past work. We find higher relative prevalences of, uh, uh, among groups that past work has also found to have higher relative prevalences. But this sample isn't really ideal for studying IPV for various reasons. So we're actually now working on a follow-up paper uh, on better samples so that we can kind of focus in more on this question specifically. Like the goal is really not to just write a methods paper. It was to study IPV specifically. So we're, we're going back to that question in the second paper. Um, we also show uh, that the method is applicable beyond healthcare. So intuitively, like, there's often cases we care about underreporting, right? Where, like, something we care about isn't perfectly reported. Um, and one condition, one, one thing we look at is, is hate speech, basically. We look at, um, you know, it, it, we look at comments on, 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 on online forums, and we look at, basically, how does the prevalence of hate speech vary depending on whom the comment is about? So if the comment is about women versus men, et cetera, uh, who has the higher prevalences of hate speech um, about them? And, you know, we find a couple things that basically make sense. Uh, one is that, like, if a comment mentions someone's identity at all, that's sort of a red flag. It's more likely to be hate speech. So intuitively, a comment that begins, like, women always, like, maybe not going anywhere good. Um, another thing we find is that uh, comments, like, prevalences of hate speech are particularly high among sort of historically marginalized groups, you know, trans people, gay people, um, et cetera, face, high, face higher rates of hate speech, again, consistent with what you might expect. Okay, so to summarize, we provided a method to try and estimate the relative prevalence across groups, find which groups are disproportionately affected by something, even in the pre uh, presence of underreporting. We provide some checks to make sure that the method's assumptions are actually satisfied. We show reasonable results on synthetic, semi-synthetic, and real data. We're interested in applying this in other settings where basically you care about which groups are particularly affected by a condition and you're willing to believe the sort of widely used assumptions the model makes. Uh, other settings we've discussed include uh, police misconduct, which is like often very underreported, um, IPV, which we're working on now, long COVID, you know, clearly, clearly very important, clearly very underreported in formal medical records. You know, come talk to me if you have other, other ideas. We're, we're very happy to continue this in, in other applications. Uh, so, yeah, that concludes my talk. Broadly, you know, I use machine learning to increase health equity by trying to make decision-making fair and understanding the health of understudied populations. Today I talked about the latter direction. <laughs>